You are listening to Port Pod. Join us as we bring you entertaining interviews and untold stories from our rugby club, past and present. Brought to you by Southport Rugby Club. It's making me nervous because I can't see if it's recorded, but it is. It is. Right, guys, welcome back to the Southport Port Pod. It's been a long time uh, since we've done one, but we thought well, there's been some interesting things going on, so we thought we'd get together, have a chat, see uh, see how we get on. So a few firsts that we're going to do today. Uh, it's the first time I've done a podcast live with the people who I'm actually podcasting. Uh, normally we do it over Zoom, but today we're doing it live, so I'm hoping the audio works okay. Secondly, first, it's the first time I've done one sober without a drink, so I'm not too sure how that's gonna how that's gonna pan out for everybody, but, but we'll see how this goes. Um, okay, so with me tonight, today, this afternoon, whatever it is, I've got Mike Dale, who's the director of rugby for been the director of rugby for 12 years at Southport. He's the women's girl girls Lancashire lead. He's a Southport lady, coach and manager. He's also an honorary VIP of Southport Rugby Club. That's a lot of words in one in one sentence. We've got Darren Hall, who is the current Southport head coach and everyone's favourite South African. We've got Ben Davis, who is a National League ma- match official on the national panel since 2015. Uh, he's a current level three and four match official. He's a former Liverpool Society um, training officer, so we've got him to blame for the training of the referees, <laughs> essentially. So welcome, guys. How are you? Is everyone okay? Not bad, folks. Thanks for having me in show, folks. Yeah, it's good. I always do my best for you. <laughs> um, so we're gonna we'll put this podcast together to go through some of the recent goings on with the with the law changes or the proposed law changes within uh, within rugby. I'll go through a brief history of what's happened over the last mo- last month or so, and then we will we can start discussing it and see what everyone's views are and what we think has happened and what we think is going to happen. So. Thursday the 19th of January, there was a press release, I think it's fair to say, that was a surprise to everyone about the tackle height in rugby. It was targeted as a grassroots level or amateur level change in tackle height. By the 23rd of January, there was a a petition was started. Um, On the 26th of January, World Rugby did an interview and saying that this is going to be coming in at all levels. By the 27th of January, there were 75,000 uh, names on a petition. World Rugby released a statement saying they had no plans to bring in the change in tackle height, and RFU released a statement apologising for the concerns they'd caused. Basically, it's been a shambles for a month. So, what's everyone's view on it? Uh, we'll come to you first, Mike, see what you think. I think my biggest problem with it all is the lack of engagement with us as a community game. I think the community game at the moment is not getting consulted on a great deal, but to come out with a statement like that, without the true facts and the backtracking that's gone on since, is uh, it's not great for the game, is it? No. It feels a little bit like, uh, yeah, like, like they weren't quite sure what they were doing, but did, Darren, did you see the, uh, did you see it coming? Did you see this law change coming? No, not at all. Um, and the reaction from the players, from my players, said it all. Uh, just unhappy, confused, um, not sure. I can understand th- why they want to go down that route for, for, for safety reasons, but there's no time to officiate it properly. It's like, okay, that's going to happen, it's going to happen in three, four months' time, and everyone needs to be on the same page. And sometimes we already struggle at grassroots level to keep the tackle heights already lower than the dangerous levels they're at now. So to go, what, five inches lower, it's hard to, to put all that kind of pressure on the officials. And especially if there's only one official, you know, if, if there's a team of three, you can, I'd understand it being a little bit more controlled, but then to put all of that pressure onto one individual um, is, uh, you know, th- there'll be moments where games will be won and lost in the dying minutes because of the, a high tackle or what will be deemed as a new high tackle and you're going to have a lot of angry supporters and uh, staff and players because one ref might allow it to touch high and one will 
n won't even look at it and penalize it immediately. Yeah. The only one thing I'd like to know from yourself, Ben, is when did you guys find out about this? Yeah. Just sorry, just to interrupt before Ben answers, I realised I've just said that the release a statement uh, changing the tackle height. Some people not may not have seen this the, the statement. The tackle height is proposed from uh, July is it July next year mm. to come down to waist height only. Anything above waist height is a high tackle. That's the proposed law change. So sorry, we'll carry on. Sorry, Ben. Well, I think you know, one of the things you missed out from that timeline there, uh, Pugs, was the amount of text messages that I received as soon as that came out. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think the internet time. almost got broke. Um, but as I say, I think the change in the tackle height is something that I think people have been concerned about with them would be since along, you know, for the last few years. And how that came out was probably not what the RFU thought, but I think it was well intentioned. But I think the engagement, as Mike quite rightly mentioned, might be something to reflect on to make. You know, our game, you know, still be, be be accessible to all really. I think one of the things that Dan mentioned as well was that there was always a lot of talk about the actual tackle height. There's also going to be a bit more of a focus on actually what the ball carrier is doing as well in relation to dipping into the contest, etc. etc. And that's something as a referee we um, will always looking at, you know, the safety of the players across the, both attack and defence. In response to Dan's question, I think the big thing that we're going to find out as referees both from the National League perspective and from the community game is over the summer when no doubt training courses will run you know across the whole country in order to allow us to be ready for this change in tackle right if when how it occurs is going to be the uh, is going to be the major thing yeah. do, you, do you think that because now um, I know Mike is attending a a meeting tomorrow with, with Lancashire, Mike. So it's the executive council members um, will be in attendance to give us their point of view. We've had the statement regarding the rationale behind why they've done this and the injuries and everything that way, but the lack of involvement from community game right the way through. Yeah, I, I think they're now looking to consult. Yeah. But this is, it's, it strikes me as uh, shutting the door after the horse has bolted. It, they haven't consulted with anyone prior to making the decision, so it's come, I think, as a bit of a shock to everyone. And as all people know, run large organisation, what people don't like is, is shock and, and things changing quickly with, with no prior, prior knowledge or notice. Is this, in general, a reaction to concussions and the RFU being sued because by, you know, uh, by all the famous players who, who have been in that, is it 42 people who are suing them? Mm -hmm. Is this a reaction to that because they're so scared of being being sued? Is that why why they've made the decision to lower the ta tackle height or do you think it's just injuries in general? I think there's been a lot in the press about obviously the players who've, who've chosen to take legal action against various unions across the world and, and more notably no, 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 in the United Kingdom but I think as a game we're, we're always quick to react. I think Sometimes if you think about, so some of us remember when professionals came in and how the game benefited or suffered in those early years in relation to how the game was structured, etc. So I'm sure the RFU have got a, a, a plan about how to make the game safer and build more accessible for all. But I think the interesting thing for us is, as, as members of an esteemed rugby club and you know, been involved again for a long period of time, it's making the game safe for our the players now and for the people who are going to start playing the game but you know we, we can't take away from what rugby is and rugby is a contest between you know it's a physical contest and that's something that you know we'll, we're all probably you know keen to be involved and that's what you know, we want to see really. One thing that I'll ask, I'll ask you about Darren is it's one of the things that struck me is the wording of it which was amateur rugby and grassroots level. I think personally I think that's a bit of a misconception because this is from level one downwards, would you consider amateur rugby level one rugby? No, not at all. I mean, level one is you, you, you're one step away from premiership status, which is your elite players. These are the, the guys that have earned the rights to get big contracts, they've earned the right to represent their countries if they can push on a little bit further. Um, so, you know, when you're dealing with, when you go down the line, uh, five, six, seven, eight. The, the training is completely different. The mindset is completely different. The way you condition your body is completely different. So you, you cannot compare a level one rugby player to anyone lower than level four. 
there's no comparison to the way that they prepare for a Saturday as opposed to a level one rugby player. Um, and, and in terms of the tackle height, uh, Mike, the, the, the suggestion is waist height. Uh, watching some some scientists who've done the studies on concussions and things comment on it, and, and what they've said is. There is a red zone whenever there's head near head and whenever there's an opportunity or a chance to get head near head which comes in when you're tackling sort of chest, nipple and above. But there's also another red zone when you get towards the bottom end, sort of below hip height because you then have knees involved. And, well, just to, to, to add another bit on, into the conversation, when they trialled it in France, which has, has been a trial in France, it was only one person allowed in the tackle. Yeah. So do, do you see any issues with the fact that it has gone so low, so so far away from obviously now it's sort of anything below the shoulder, is it, Ben? Yeah, that's right. So obviously at the moment we're working on a sort of a framework of a shoulder and above in relation to managing high tackles. I think the French model of having one tackle in, obviously that might you might struggle with that problems. I mean you, you know <laughs> tackling on your own for the last no, 15 no, years. No. Uh, no, so, bad but you know, you know, obviously we've got to, you know, we've got to be in awareness of that. Really, it's keeping you playing for as long as we possibly can. Um, but I think the height of the tackle as it changes now, I think there's something that we're all going to have to look at. But if we, the French model is obviously what the French have decided to do. There's obviously I think there's some changes in relation to how the New Zealanders play in relation to their lower levels. But over here, the grassroots rugby is a different. It's a different type of game. It's a forwards dominated game. You know, English rugby, you know, is built by the wall. You know, I think the wall might be an interesting concept and in how that's set up. Um, but also, you know, it's it's going to fundamentally change the game that we all love and, and how that change is made is going to be interesting. And you know, going on from my personal perspective, from a referee perspective, it changes how we train our referees, how we, you know, mentor them, how we um, get them ready to deal with such a massive seismic shift for players who are playing in a certain way for a long period of time and then all of a sudden have to change something that ultimately us as referees are going to have to see on that day-to-day -day basis when we're out in the middle. So, um, yeah, challenging time, I think. I agree. And for myself, certainly as a director of rugby, we want to keep as many people in the game as we possibly can. At a community level, there'll be a lot of people turn around and say, rugby's not the sport that it used to be because of a lot of changes that have happened through that. And I know we've had quite a few people that have gone through ourselves, but it was only two weeks ago when I lost one of my first team players from a knee. So he legitimate tackle, caught the knee of the player, had concussion that way. So I think when I first started playing rugby, yes, it was all about tackle around the waist and do everything else. But as the game's progressed over years, the contest's progressed. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more physical now. It's also about, um, obviously, stopping the offload. Uh, and, and with the law changing, um, Darren, how would you see tactics changing? If, it, if indeed it does come in as proposed, if as a ball carrier you cannot lean, you can't lean into the tackle, and as a, an attacker, sorry, as a defender, you can only tackle waist height. Surely that's going to promote the offload. Yeah, I, th I think your training will have to be amended to to those laws. But I'm also thinking more along the lines of you're going to. I think that the card ratio per game is going to be higher, yeah. um, especially in the initial six months because the referees will have to find their rhythm yeah. and obviously when you've got 50, 30 lads screaming at a referee because they all think it's higher than what they've seen on a chart, yeah. the ref's going to have to be under pressure and make decisions so I think you, your training will also have to come down to like maybe training with 14 men for 10 minutes and maybe even 13, you'd have yeah. to kind of incorporate that into how... The fact that you're going to have to play the last numbers yes, and how are you going to look in your set piece, how are you going to look in your defence because you have to take that into consideration. You know, these are things that, you know, it's just as vital to, to being successful because you know that you're not going to, no team's going to go through a game unscathed in the first five, six games. You're going to lose guys to, to cards because they're going to try their best, but, you know, habits are habits. It's yeah. hard to break habits sometimes. So, so if you were to, if you were to get a tap, penalty five metres from the line. How do you stop that if you can only tackle waist and below? The no, words of Roman Poit and the referee, not the coach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a fair point, but you know, 
I, I, I don't see a possible way of sh- no, unless you catch someone straight from the front yeah. and you've got them back. I think on basically you tackle yeah. four forward and score the try. Yeah, I mean, forward I was involved again on Saturday uh, at time down and that situation did arise where you know there was a tap penalty on the five metre line and you know if if we didn't enforce the, the tackle laws that you know potentially are coming in, yeah, we'd have either had penalty try or the. You know, if they didn't score, we'd be looking at definite foul play and, and, and dealing with it as as is. But you know, those kind of situations are you know isolated incidents in the game, but very important, aren't they? You know, that's a real key area of the stuff that where tries are going to be scored. And referees are looking for a lot of things when that happens. When we're in that you know in and around the goal line, you know, tackle height is something that's going to be really interesting because you know if you think about the foul play and how penalty tries are given. You know, if for that active foul play, I like to try would have been scored, but we're going to be under the six. Yeah. So, um, yeah, something to, something to definitely think about. I do not feel that the, um, obviously, the judgment of whether a player is lowering into contact and whether a player is around the waist, mm. uh, I know you probably like this, but means that the referee is the most important person on the pitch, almost, because every single contact, I know they do already, yeah. <laughs> Every single, every single yeah. tackle they have to. Make. I know they sort of do already, but not to this extent. They have to make an assessment of whether the ball carrier is leaning in or whether the tackle player is going is has ridden up above yeah. the waist. I think you know that's a really good point. That because I mean we have played against each other and you know and how I carried the ball when I played and how you carry the ball when you are still playing. You know that was a big part of our games. Yeah. Um, as a referee, you're making five hundred probably plus. Decisions, assessments per half potentially. So, in trying to referee the ball carrier, down the tackler, and then having a tackler or a rook after that is is going to be an interesting kind of process, really. I think it's something that referees will adapt to, but I think the lower level referees may find that a bit more of a challenge. And you know, in this you know era of you know trying to retain people within the game, you know, that might be another another stressor to that already. You know, difficult game as a referee, and, and some people may walk away from it. Hopefully, hopefully they won't. But um, but something yeah. that we, we we've got to consider. I think. How do you think Mikey plays into the back to rugby policy of the RFU, which is trying to get players back involved in rugby? Surely it, it retracts from that because people are going to go, "I'm not going back to that. It's not the game I left." Absolutely, and getting them players that have not been playing, getting back playing, is one of the key things. I think. One thing we might see at the moment as well, all the inclusive rugby's, i.e. the touch, the um, the ready for rugby, that's great initiatives. If we carry on playing them all the time, where does the normal game go? The, the game at the moment, we're losing players around the community level. And I think there is, rugby, rugby's a sport that everybody wants to play, everyone wants to officiate, but we're not getting to that point at the moment. It'll be interesting to see what's said tomorrow night at this meeting. Yeah. I'm attending, so... Uh, so who, who, who will be at this meeting, what, what's the likely turnout? They've invited at least two people per club, and he's full, it's at Liverpool St. Helens tomorrow night, and the exec council members are there, um, Lancashire RFU are doing it, every RFU are doing this consultation, but like you said earlier, it's like the horses. Yeah. bought it already, and they've got to do it now, they've said in their mandate that they will consult, it's a little bit late. People probably would have been a lot more accepting if you phase this in over a few years. Yeah. And your children that are playing at the moment, maybe at 13, 14, as they grow through. And maybe that's why the French have done it. You look at how good the French are at the moment, they're under the 20s team. If they've been doing it for three or four years, it's natural in the way that they're taking the ball carriers. But we're not at that point. And I think trying to keep people in rugby at the moment's hard. We're quite lucky at this club where we've got three teams on a regular basis. We've got a ladies team that's doing very well in junior sections, but how many schools, how many people will turn off playing rugby because of the perceived risk? Yeah, that was, that was a good point. But does the, the game of rugby has always been a physical contest, although it's not a collision sport, it's supposed to be a game of evasion. Collision is a huge part of the sport. Do you think this is going to detract from that? Do you think it's going to make it softer as a game in, in, in general? I don't think you could ever make rugby soft. <laughs> okay. I think safe is what, what 
the goal. Yeah. Um, enjoyable is always number one, isn't it? That's you know it's part of what we all in what what we want as coaches, players, refs. We want to come off the field after eighty minutes and say, "Wow, some really good things were done there," and everyone enjoyed themselves at a physical, at a high physical level, good pace, good energy, and good sportsmanship. I think this maybe questions a bit of the sportsmanship at times in the beginning, maybe because both teams will always look for an advantage. Yeah. Um, so you will be questioning the ref more, I think, which is which shouldn't be allowed, especially because I think they're giving them the right to say referee is that. You know, you're asking him something that he's seen himself, but you're not focusing on what what you as a player should be doing is playing the game. Um, I think they should have trialed this first, maybe. Yeah. You know, like really gone down the route of maybe what the French did, um, but maybe on a, on a longer scale. So we've got 24 months, and let's let's start try out juniors, the the Colts, and then to seniors in the at grassroots and get responses back and then work off of real evidence. I know we've got safety evidence, yeah. but we don't have players' input. And I think they're the ones that put the money into the game. Yeah. They buy the ticket and tickets, the, the England jerseys, the, you know, the money comes from the grassroots, so you can't hide that fact. So you're not asking them how they want their game run, you're telling them, and if you trial it, it's kind of a 50-50, you're saying, well, we're thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to it's, this is how it's going to be. So, I mean, there is, but I'm sure there's things that will come out from the, your meeting and other meetings, and they'll go back to HQ and they'll say, listen, guys, you know, we've got serious concerns here. Let's, let's, let's focus on one, two, and three, whatever that may be for them, and let's try and work with the communities more. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think I would be... Um out of order saying that I don't think anybody around this uh, table or stool as I like to call it um, would disagree that the tackle height probably does need to be lowered I think the problem comes the fact that they've done it without any consultancy and it's so extreme they haven't lowered it by 6 inches 12 inches they've lowered it by half the size of your body into an area that scientists are saying is dangerous has anybody heard anybody say anything positive about it and said they think it's a good idea and they think it will improve the game? I've heard a few scrum halves that play this club <laughs> and a couple of others that oh, yeah. uh, have maybe been very positive about it. No, definitely not. And I don't doubt when there was, what, 80,000 people at Twickenham at the weekend, it was probably the talking point over a pint for most people. Yeah, well, I have to kind of part the Land Rover somewhere and chat about something. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? After they put the shooting jackets on, they've got to have something to talk about. <laughs> but Ben, have you heard anyone say anything positive about it from the referee's perspective? When the ref's gone, oh, I can't wait to ref this. Yes, I mean, I mean, referee is is a it's a poison chalice in some ways. But I think when new laws and things come out, you know, some referees do get a little bit excited about it. Some other things blow the whistle about in some cases. Yeah. But in other ways, it sometimes gives us an opportunity to see how the game develops. I think you watch referees who referee in the game. Oh, I don't know, in the 90s, and, you, and I watch those games back now on YouTube in the quiet nights of a two-year-old. Um, those games were just jungle warfare, but now the game has developed a little bit into a game that's a bit more respectable. Has the game developed in relation to the amount of kicking that we see now in the top level game? Yeah, I think maybe a lower tackle height may encourage a bit more of an attack. The one thing I would say, you know, if you watch the games, you know, in the early days when we were growing up, Cogs were watching the Super 12 and seeing yeah. those kind of games and how that, you know, reinvented or reinvigorated the game yeah. as professionalism came in. You know, could the lower tackle height make a quicker game? Could it see the play become a bit more open? But I think if you look back at those games in the Super 12 of the 90s, you know, the game was open and it was free and, and everyone played and it was something yeah. that you, you know, it was a joy to watch and everyone watched it, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. You know, you think about that now, is it within the Premiership? Is the same, is there the same happiness about the game? I'm, I'm not sure. But from a referee perspective, going back to your point, Pugs is, uh, you know, I think you know, it will be a challenge for us. I think it will be something that I'm hopefully we'll adapt to quite quickly if, it, if and when it comes in. But, you know, as long as there's technical areas, I'm, I'm always going to be happy. Yeah, the only... Sorry, mate. The only positive I can see in the whole thing is this could be the end of Gary Spengler. <laughs> he, he, he could have to retire on this because he can't get his head around it. It's the only real positive I can see. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Did I jump in on you there? Oh dear. Uh, no, it's. 
I think there's going to have to be, if it is implemented, I think the engagement between coaches, referees, clubs, referees has got to start really early. Never mind how a few doing their bit because the referees, we can't play a game without them. And I've tried. <laughs> you, you certainly have. <laughs> you've, had, you've been playing a few games on your touchline as well. Yeah, while they've sort of nice. managed to give you a Christmas card. But um, well, I think one of the big things is, is that engagement across the whole place at the moment. It is key. If they are a few engaged with us and the referees, there's no question we all want to make it safer. Mm. Without yeah. a shadow of a doubt. Well, I do think that, and I'm sure it does a great though it is frustrating, the head concussion protocol has been a new, fairly new thing in recent seasons and it has led to lots of players having lots of time off the field that wouldn't have happened three or four years ago. Yeah, totally. Uh, you know, we must have had six, seven, eight. Twelve. Twelve. I was getting there if you left me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously it's frustrating in terms of selecting sides, but you know, Darren doesn't agree, I'm sure, with selecting anyone who's not fit to play, particularly if it's an injury you can't see. Um, the, I just want to go on to something slightly different, slightly, slightly a bit. We'll, we'll, we'll leave this now at the tackle height, and we'll look at other laws in the game. So, if you could change any laws in the game to improve the game for the spectator, or for fun, or for, to make it better, or better, as my mum would tell me to say, what um, what laws would you change to make the game to improve the game? I can tell you mine. I've got them written down for ages. Go on, man. Uh, I'd probably take away the scrum option from free kicks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you know a lot of people take you know a lot of referees you know will pin a free kick from an early engagement. I think a lot of teams will just take the scrum again. Yeah, the game's slowed down. Yeah, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We have a free kick, you know, from a mark. The game's with the balls back in play, but I think from a free kick from scrum offensive. Do you not think the timings and everything will help the game to be a little bit quicker? The proposed timings and everything that should come in. Uh, what to quicken up goal yeah. kicks? I, mean, I think that's another thing that refereeing is. You know, it's going to take it more difficult. I think we've we've got an onus to, for sixty seconds at penalties and nineties at uh, ninety seconds at try score at the moment. I think there's a be a brave referee to implement that yeah. anywhere on the, this side yeah. of the uh, thing. Well, you know, certainly, that's something that I will be looking at. One one of my pet hates is, and I'll ask you this one, Darren: scrummage. Particularly, not so much at grassroots level, but more at international level. Reset scrums, do you think that's an issue within the game? It's always going to be an issue when you've got one tongue versus another tongue yeah. trying to dominate the shoulder battle first, the, the angle battles, and then obviously the power that follows through. It's hard to. But more in particular, it's use in gamesmanship. So yeah. if you're winning the game by like three points or four points, and you've got four minutes on the clock and you get a scrum, that's the game over. Because you kill the scrum, you kill the scrum, you kill the scrum, you kick the ball out. Yeah, I mean, it does fall down into a little bit of dirty tactics that are all over the, the park. And, um, but then again, it's the refs to pick that up and I think the top refs do pick that up. They'll, they'll, they'll read the body language of the team that's in control of the ball and they'll know that there's no urgency there. There's constantly shifting, constantly um, taking away from a fair contest and I think you know there uh, should be a I don't know to, you should identify it and maybe penalise yeah. that maybe a free yeah. kick that's not so much yeah, more of a take, penalty take away the take away the um, scrum from the free kick scrum just from the free kick and then we can ball back in play then so you can kick it out or you yeah. can yeah. yeah. Uh, any other laws, Mike, that you, you think if we did that, that would make the game better? No, I thought the way that the rules changed over the last number of years has certainly brought more cynicism into the rook. I came from a background where the, the players refereed that aspect of the game, which they will never catch on. Uh, he'll never catch on. <laughs> <laughs> but he gave the referee one less thing to worry about. I wouldn't dare lay on one side of the rook just because I, I can. There are still players who are still. The, some of the cheap infringements that are out there. I think interpretation, but just consistency, that's mm. one of the things. I would somehow, I don't, know, I don't know what law you would bring in to do it, I would take out the caterpillar in the rook. Yeah. I think it's just waste so much time in the game, while Scrum gives us come out for an arm ride to box kick the ball. He doesn't even need to pro- practice box kicking with any pressure on him now, because if you set up a caterpillar, there's never going to be any pressure on you. And it just 
for me it slows the game down so much mm. I wouldn't allow I don't know how you'd form a law which means you can't purposely lengthen a rock or mm. however, however you do it because mm. I do think it, it detracts from the game I appreciate it as a South African you love a good box kick Darren <laughs> but, uh, it's not it's not something that would that would do something that I think improves the game I thought that was interesting a couple of weeks ago the premiership game I think it was Harlequins that yeah. Marley disengaged yeah. his arm mm. and Credit to was it? Evan Esterbeth. Evan Esterbeth yeah. that yeah. spotted it. And that was on the caterpillar. Right. And he ran through. And basically he went he through, through 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 yeah, I thought, serve you right. Yeah. <laughs> I have seen it as well where the users the attacking option when they set up a caterpillar, because as soon as you do that the wingers drop and then they've passed it from the base mm-hmm. because the wingers are dropped and they've used it as a bit of a foil yeah. to, to set up an attack. Uh, it can be done. So in terms of Stories, Ben, you've got a few. I'm hopefully there's none involving me here because I do remember one particular incident where we had you laughing in the middle of a game. I didn't think it was a could have been a Vats game or something. But well, do you know what, Kenzo? I was definitely thinking about that one, but I'll have to scrub that one. Okay, later. thank you. <laughs> um, funny stories you've had in terms of laws, things given that you like. How's that been given? Like ridiculous decisions where you mm. think, what has gone on here? Well, I've seen a few. I've um, seen a few. Sorry, I'm about that. I hope the decisions that I make are all generally. Relatively consistent. I think the biggest thing for me as a referee, I remember refereeing Ilkley versus York on exchange at about level seven, probably ten years ago. Big game, big assessor, Yorkshire, the guy from Lancashire ran out, didn't have a cards, didn't even have a whistle. I had to stop the game to go back to the game. I got to stop that guy, I got to get a whistle. I once played in a game, I think it was at um, Buxton away, and Chris Desher, our wing at the time, very quick, very good player, got the ball, two hands. Went to pass it to the fullback, but the fullback was in front of him, so he pulled the ball back, retracted it. Whistle goes, penalty. What for, Rath? Attempted forward pass. And that was the referee's words give a penalty against him for an attempted forward pass. He didn't pass the ball, it never left his hand. If you just, if you just leave his name and number, please. Yeah, but <laughs> penalty for an attempt. I'll get your apologies. Taz, you must have seen some. Any? I've oh, seen many things. Um... So I just think of the top of my head, like, yeah. which one really stands out? I saw a player got sent off once for his coach on the sideline. So his coach on the sideline was screaming at the ref, and the referee <laughs> said, which team are you from? And he said, I'm from the blue team. It was in sports tours. So the referee pulled the blue captain over, sent him off, <laughs> right? So the blue captain leaves the field, gets to the edge of the field, and the blue coach, and the other coach is going, He's lied to you there, ref. He's not our coach. <laughs> so he lied to the ref until the one coach got a man sent off. He then returned to the field and the other captain got sent off. It was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. That was uh, in, in a final, I think, in Postworth. So it was on the main pitch there. Yeah. But yeah, there's been a few ones. Ben, I need to ask you this question while we've got you on. What's your worst ever refereeing decision? Have you ever made a decision and after the game gone, oh, I got that completely wrong? We're all human. We're all human. <laughs> it's not, this isn't my beers, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm done, not earning up to anything, but I think my girl was quite keen to, uh, quite keen to, uh... Is he not saying I'm not a person off him? Well, there's a national league game, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so there was a national league game, um, at Sale in Starbridge, um, and I'll give him a call, uh, we've got a foul play down, um, you know, kick to the head, so I'm thinking, here we go, something's going on, um, so I sent the wrong player off, and not only did they send one player off, I sent the captain off who was six foot six, and the guy who kicked him there was three foot three. And then just a few phone calls ensued in the week, and ultimately the outcome was, uh, yeah, rescinded. But yeah, 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 not one of my greatest days. Ah, oh, well, we all made mistakes, even I made one once. 2005, it was a long time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask you now, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks very much for everyone for coming, but we do have to all add a song to the Port Pod playlist. Now, I did ask everyone to have one ready before we came here. Mike's thinking, I've not thought of one, haven't he? Ben knows it is. It's not Thomas the Tank Engine. No, no it's not. going to have to be a Spandau Ballet Gold. Oh, no, right. That's good. That is gold. <laughs> Daz. Come on, we must have something. Yeah, there's plenty, but I think we'll go with a, go with a classic. We'll go with a bit of Queen, another one by the dust. Oh, wow, right, that's a good one. These are all going to be added onto the, the Port Pod playlist that you can download off uh, nowhere in particular. Uh, Mike? I think my favourite one's already gone. Many of your podcasts have already been there through ACDC Thunderstruck because 
so relevant to cheating us up on a certain 26 hour game that you organised and got us going again. Uh, but one of the modern ones, more recent, that I hear in your changing room, regular on a Saturday and regular in the ladies, it's got to be Belter. Oh, yeah. Jerry Cinnamon. Well, it's a Belter, as the goal was gold. Right, guys, thank you very much for, for listening. Thanks very much to Mike, Daz, and Ben, my guests. And uh, we will hear, well, you'll hear from me again very soon. We've got another few podcasts lined up. Thanks a lot. We'll hear soon. You are listening to Port Pod, brought to you by Southport Rugby Club.